Okay, I think we'll begin now. Um, so hi everyone, welcome to the third session of the BEMA Pediatric Crash Course, uh, which is part of our specialty series that we are running this term. Uh, today, Dr. Shiv Sharma, who is an AFP doctor and has a specialist interest in pediatrics, uh, will be going through neonatal medicine. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules uh, throughout the talk, if you could keep your microphones muted. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to write them in the chat or ask them at the end of the talk. Um, we will be recording this talk and it will be uploaded onto the Beamer website um, and the YouTube channel. Um, and slides will be emailed out to everybody who fills in the feedback form at the end. Um, so thank you for everyone who came today and over to you, Dr. Shiv Sharma. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, so neonatology, so I'm, I'm an F1, if you weren't there at the first talk, I'm one of the F1s at Barnet Hospital. I'm on surgery at the moment. Um, I was at Imperial uh, until obviously last year. Um, that's how I know Amar. So pediatrics is an interest of mine. Um, here's your BIMA team. I don't know if so, we want to come back and introduce everyone properly or we can just keep going. Uh, yeah, just keep going. That's fine. Sweet. Um, okay, so what we're going to aim to do here is go through neonatology. Obviously, it's a really, really deep topic and it's a very broad topic. Um, so I just want to cover it in a depth that gives you a bit of an appreciation for the subject, uh, things that are useful for exams, things that are useful clinically, and I'll explain why they might be, even if you're not gonna be a neonatologist or a pediatrician. Um, and also some of it is just cool from a scientific perspective uh, beyond what you might need for the SBAs and the buzzwords for your exams. Um, so what I'm gonna do is cover the neonatal examination, uh, neonatal life support, um, right at the start of life, I'm going to recognize common congenital heart disease issues and give you some, a quick framework to work through them because I know they're really complicated and everyone's always asking tricky questions about them. Neonatal jaundice, I think, is one of the things that a lot of people, including myself, struggle with at medical school. And to be honest, still, still do. And you know, I need to remind myself to, um, when I come back to think about it, for talks like this. So I had to go back and learn it. So I'll give you a simple framework for that. And then we'll briefly touch on the preterm infant. That's, that could be a whole two hours in itself. Uh, and beyond, so I will just briefly touch on it. What I can't teach you in an hour and a half is things, you know, neonatal infections and sepsis is a complex topic, um, and I think it's best covered elsewhere. Bowels and meconium, Hirschsprung's disease, those things are really important to learn about, but I, again, like, I just couldn't cover it without, you know, boring you all. And then eyes, ears, I don't know anything about them anyway, um, but even then they're beyond the scope of this. The brain is very complicated in the developing Neonate uh, metabolic diseases are very interesting, but again, probably even beyond medical school knowledge. Uh, immunodeficiencies, again, probably not that important, maybe for your pathology exams. So general principles. So a neonatal period encompasses the first 28 days of life. Okay, and that's slightly different than a preterm infant. Uh, but generally in a term infant born at 38 or 39 or 40 weeks, the first 28 days is defined as a neonatal period. Um, so your congenital conditions often are the ones which are presenting in the neonatal period, which makes it really interesting. Um, in adult medicine, you've got a lot of degenerative conditions, lifestyle related conditions, wear and tear, like that, that, is, that is the mainstay of what you're treating. But in neonatal period, you haven't had time for any of that to happen. So a lot of it is pre-existing disease, which is quite interesting, I think. Um, why is it important for you guys? Well, if you want to be an A&E doc, a core medical trainee, a GP, anything really, you need to have an appreciation for these because people with congenital disorders are now living well into adulthood from the start of the 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s. You now have people living a lot longer and living with the condition, not dying of it in childhood. So the congenital condition continues to adulthood. You'll see someone with a cardiac surgery, for example, who's now in their 40s or 50s. And that is actually not as uncommon as you think it might be. Uh, babies born premature will have higher survival rates now uh, because the NICU is, is, has been so good over the last decade. Um, but they have significant mor morbidity. So you're going to see a lot more of them as a healthcare professional proportionate to a, a normal healthy person, for example. Um, and then again, in, in children, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, how you get not that many clues and not that many clinical signs, um, but you get even fewer in the neonate, uh, which makes it even trickier. Okay, so assessment of the neonate. Um, you're looking at... Uh, something like this, right? This is the APGAR score. Um, and I've, I've 
showing you what it stands for. So appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiratory effort. And this is how it's broken down. And this is a really quick way. So last two weeks ago, I showed you the pediatric traffic light system, right? Which I thought was a much more useful clinical way of looking at it. And this is the APGAR score, which they use for neonates. And it's used right at the start of life. So delivery up to 10, 15, maybe half, maybe 30 minutes post-delivery, um, but not, not weeks before after that. You're not talking about patients in terms of the APGAR scores. But what it does is it gives you a really quick snapshot of what uh, a neonate is like at, at delivery and at the time in a few minutes um, following delivery during resuscitation period. So it is, you add these up, okay? So for each category, you add it up, giving you a maximum score of 10 and a minimum score of zero. A minimum score of zero is really bad news. Um, obviously it's a very subjective score, okay? So your normal range is sort of seven to 10. Seven to 10, you're not really worried. Some babies naturally might need a little bit of um, encouragement with their respiratory effort um, or their heart rate might take a little bit of time coming up, but they are breathing well. That can just be natural variation. Um, but you need to just have this as a quick measure of wellness. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen neonatal resuscitation or the baby, you know, right at the start when, when a baby is born, um, pediatrician will usually take them to the side and check them over uh, and make sure they're resuscitated well. Um, but in these situations, it's very hard to just do the score, especially if the baby needs a bit of ventilation or as we'll show you the algorithm in a minute. Um, so it is a rough guide, okay? And it can give you an idea of what's happening. So you generally don't do it at birth. If the baby needs resuscitation, you just start resuscitating. You don't stop, stop and calculate their at score before you start doing anything. You, you always start doing something first. So you do one minute, five minutes, and 10 minutes. That's the convention. That may change by the time you graduate. Okay, so don't take it set in stone, but like that, it's just a rough sort of time frame you're trying to look at. And what you're looking at is a trajectory, right? So a baby may be born with an app of five, and they may respond well, and they might go up to seven at five minutes and nine at 10 minutes. And then you'd be happy with that. You'd be like, you know what? They're actually doing pretty good. There's a positive trajectory. The things we're doing are helping. The baby's on the mend. They may still need to go to you know, the unit to have a, um, observations for a few hours or a, or a day or two, but you're, you're happy with the direction they're going in. If they're below seven, then you are worried. If they're persistently below seven or they start dropping, they start at eight maybe, and they go down to six and five or four, then you start to get more worried. But it is very subjective, right? So things like reflex irritability, you know, grimace on, you know, uh, muscle tone, can be very like some you know it can be hard to assess especially when you're trying to do a lot of other things with a child um for the purpose of your exams the apgar score will be you know your bible you look at it and it will tell you the wellness of the baby in that snapshot at delivery so you want to use that score to uh guide it you know, just use it as a tool as general wellness of the infant at birth and then in like a month if the baby's on niku for a month for example then you could say well apgar's at birth worse five or six and you go, like, okay, so they didn't have, they didn't have a normal delivery. They, they weren't really well straight out of the, the womb. Okay, so it gives you an idea of what's going on. Here's neonatal resuscitation by the, the council. So it's different and it's a bit more complex. It looks a lot, certainly looks a lot more complex than the pediatric or adult algorithms. There are some important things to note. So the first thing is to dry the baby, okay? So we, we did cover four H's and four T's for uh, you know, cardiac arrest still apply in the pediatric, in the neonatal phase and hypoxia is something that we can do that makes a big difference. Something like every one degree below 36.5 that a baby is, the mortality in NICU raises by five to 10%. That's every one degree. So if you don't dry the baby, there's a very simple thing you could be doing that can affect their prognosis in the weeks and months to come, especially if they're preterm, okay? So the main focus as with pediatrics, but to a greater extent is the respiratory system. And we'll cover that, I'll show you in a second, the importance of the respiratory system in the, in the neonate. In fetal life, you know, you have your cardiovascular system more or less established. There's a few changes, but we'll talk about that later. Your renal system is more or less established. Your brain is, is ongoing in development, but you've got the basics. You've got basic reflexes and things like that. So you do have most of that developed. The lungs are not used at all in utero. And this is one of the, one of the mysteries and one of the most interesting parts of the switch from um, you know, fetal life to neonatal life is what happens at birth. So the inflation of the lungs is a very complicated thing um, and it's taken a long time to understand and probably isn't fully understood still. There's a lot of theory about it. So we do focus on the respiratory system. And, and here's what you can see. So, you know, you obviously your baby has to come out and they have to be able to inflate their lungs themselves. And it's a lot of effort that it takes, as we'll show later, to inflate your alveoli and get those smaller airways open. So you can see here, the baby will come out and they'll be breathing heavily and the heart rate will respond with breath. 
if the baby has a phase of apnea, the heart rate can drop rapidly, but we do not worry about the heart rate. Okay. You always worry about that respiratory system before you get to the heart rate. If you look how far down before you start doing compressions, it's the second to bottom box, right? That's where you start doing compressions. Even if the baby's chest and heart rate is below 60 after ventilate inflation breaths, you will then keep going with, uh, ventilation breaths for 30 seconds, even if you can't see the heart rate is responding appropriately, just because of how important the respiratory system is to uh, stimulating the cardiovascular system as well. If you get this rapid breathing phase, this primary apnea, the baby will then start going into this irregular gasping, okay? If the irregular gasping does not cause a response in the cardiovascular system, they aren't able to inflate their lungs properly, you will get a secondary phase of apnea and the heart rate will drop further, below 60 is obviously the key number. If it continues to drop at this phase, the neonate will not uh, will not be able to recover. Okay, because after that gasping phase, that secondary apnea is terminal. So at that point, a baby will have to have proper ventilation and probably intubation going on beyond that point. Okay, and there's probably a number of reasons why babies will have that will happen to babies. Some of them will just be random, and we'll never know. Some of them will be because of congenital conditions. Some of them will be to do with prematurity or the method of delivery or the you know trauma during delivery. Um, but it's super important to understand what happens to the lungs when a baby is born so that you appreciate why the neonatal resuscitation uh, is the way it is. Um, I want, can, is there a chat? There is a chat. Let me just get this up. Uh, two points for pass. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I, I, I wrote that quite tight on Thursday. I, um, there might be a couple of errors here and there. Induce, okay, right, okay, SM. That's very smart. I will just say, hold your horses. I'm not going to cover hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. You are right. It does. But that's if you have the encephalopathy, which is already a really bad sign. Okay. So hypothermia can be used in NICU care to cool the brain. If you've got brain damage, it stops the metabolic processes breaking down the brain more. However, that's detrimental to the rest of your body. So you're, always, you're doing a risk benefit analysis and you're working out that, well, the brain is so bad now. And what, hap what happens beyond this with hypoxic ischemic and encephalopathy is that it's not worth, uh, you know, it, it is worth sacrificing a bit of the rest of the body. But in a neonate who's just born, why would you start calling them? Because it's bad for all the other organs, right? So, so there's no reason to do something like that. All right, so it's a, it's a clever thought, but it's not good. It's not like an initial, we definitely don't initially want hypothermia okay it's like saying digoxin is good for people with heart failure so why don't we just give everyone digoxin at birth well it's it's not you need to have heart failure first for it to be useful okay um right i hope that's all clear so just again just have a look at that make sure they're not cold and make sure they're not uh wet and make sure that they're well oxygenated and that you're working on the respiratory system okay that's the key Medication, so you can do an umbilical vein cannula right, you know, right lower down um, in the algorithm, and you can give drugs. There's no evidence for drugs. They don't seem to help from what trials they do. Neonatal trials are notoriously uh, low quality data because of the ethics around them. But um, you just need to focus as an F1 level, F2 level, probably up to ST2 or 3 level. You need to focus on your respiratory system way more than anything else. Right, let's just quickly go over something that's pretty high, high yield and, and important to know about. So neonatal hypoglycemia, um, there's a number of reasons that can occur. And, and this is why, this is what it looks like. So the baby will be hypotonic. Okay, so it's one of the easiest and one of the few reversible, reversible causes of hypotonia if you've got a floppy baby. Uh, lethargy, jitteriness, seizures, uh, apnea expelled, you know, all these things, you should just do a cap glucose and you should always look out in your SBAs for a cap glucose reading, all right? Um, and the risk factors, it's interesting, actually, it goes both ways. So if the mother has diabetes and you've got a large baby, they're used to the high sugars in utero. So their islet cells of their pancreas will become hyperplastic and they'll have high circulating insulin. Um, in the, and then that high insulin in the neonatal life, when the maternal glucose is essentially cut off by the lack of placenta, will then cause you to have hypoglycemia um, in the neonatal period. Usually that's transient. It may last hours to, to days, maybe. Um, but it's something worth treating, especially early on, because it can cause seizures and, and all sorts of other complications. And it's a really easy thing to, um, to correct. The second thing is if the baby's too small, so if they're growth restricted or preterm, they haven't had time to, or you know, the nutritional supply to build up glycogen scores, stores. So when they are born, they are unable to release glycogen to maintain a reasonable blood sugar level. 
Um, does anyone know what level of glucose we're trying to maintain? Okay, four is a touch high. So in adults it is. In neonatal period, 2.6. I mean, I don't know how much you'll want to actually remember that specific number, but 2.6 is stuck in my head. Um, uh, so that, that's the number you're going to aim for and make sure it's above that. As long as it's above that, you're probably, you're probably safe. Um, briefly go over how to do compressions. So compressions um, in the neonatal period, it varies. I think some people will go with sort of two fingers down into the sternum. And you're going for you're still going for the depth of about a third of the chest, two fingers into the sternum. Some people will wrap around the baby, um, so my fingers would be at the back of the baby, and then the thumbs down. Um, and that's more. And, and if you're ventilating a baby by yourself, then you have to go like this, or maybe round like this with one thumb, and ventilate the baby up here. So it does vary how you do neonatal compressions. Um, it's not super important for you to know at this stage, um, and it will vary on the situation. But the principles apply. Like you're trying to get effective compression of the chest. Don't worry, you can't fracture bones in a neonate from resuscitation, um, as I learned from past med, actually, um, a few years back, because the bones are very soft and the tissue is very uh, elastic. Um, so unlike in an adult where you'll crack ribs if you're doing compressions properly, in a neonate, there's enough elasticity and enough joint space to make sure you don't fracture any ribs. Right, so 2.6. So this is something uh, quite important. I mean, sort of from our last generation, we were sort of children when this was happening, um, the back to sleep campaign. So SID, sudden infant death syndrome, was a real problem. It was affecting sort of uh, two to five children in every thousand, which, you know, doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're thinking these are normally healthy children um, and parents just woke up, you know, had cot death, it's hugely traumatic, has a huge impact on the family, on the parents, you know, there are police investigations. So this is something you, you do not want to happen. So the back to sleep campaign was done in the mid nineties. Um, and it's to prevent cot death. So the idea is that baby should sleep on their back uh, with a tight fitting bed sheet or something to, you know, to, to wrap them up, like sort of cocoon them so that they can't, you know, asphyxiate on a, on a blanket or something like that. You're essentially trying to remove risk factors for asphyxi asphyxiation from the child. Sleep on the back um, is the safest way to be. As you can see on that bottom right baby, there's a risk for asphyxiation. Um, avoid exposure to cigarette smoke, even during pregnancy it increases the risk of death in the neonatal period, um, as does maternal smoking, even smoking outside the house, and then coming inside increases the risk of SIDS for the baby, which is really interesting. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the link is there. Avoid overheating. I think that goes without saying. Uh, sleep in their own crib. So if they sleep with the parent in bed, I, I don't know exactly what the mechanism is. It's not detailed, but I imagine there's some sort of crushing injury risk or again, asphyxiation risk, which is pretty horrible for everyone concerned. No pillows or toys again. Uh, for the same reasons. And breastfeeding seems to have an impact on sudden infant's death syndrome and, and reduces the risk um, of that for, again, reasons I can't really explain and I'm sure are very obscure. Um, right, so uh, newborn check. So you're going to do a normal chest and abdominal examination. Okay, I'm not going to go through these with you. You are fifth year, coming towards the end of fifth year. You should know how to listen to a chest, listen to some lungs, and feel an abdomen, right? And check for bowel sounds. So I'm not gonna go through that, but here's things that are more specific for the neonatal examination. And I think they are, it's quite interesting because this is one of the few times that you're actually picking up genuine signs um, along the way, which can be pretty cool to find early on in life. So a red reflex, so the absence of a red reflex, excuse me, in the neonatal period um, is, indicative of congenital glaucoma, which is more the most common cause of an absent reflex, a uh, red reflex in the neonatal period, or retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma, obviously far more um, sinister and severer cause. So if you don't see a red reflex, you need to be able to think that, um, you know, you need to have a look. And, and again, this is important for you because if you're a GP, uh, you know, and, and many people will go on to be GPs, then you might get a baby who's been taken home, had a baby check at hospital, and then has a routine checkup with the the GP or the mum comes in because they're concerned or dad comes in because they're concerned. If you examine the baby, you might want to do these things in the first you know, few months because it is super important. And if someone else has missed it, you can't just assume that it's been um, picked up. Uh, scleral icterus, yeah, so neonatal jaundice, as we'll talk about later. Palate for a cleft palate, these can cause feeding issues. So if your baby's not growing, it's important to look in the mouth. And um, that's also a common GP presentation because uh, if you have cleft palate, they'll have problems attaching to the nipple and, and suckling. 
Uh, hands extra digits, they snip these off surgically, um, which sounds pretty brutal, but apparently that gives the best outcomes. Uh, palm crease, again, single palm crease, Down syndrome. Uh, femoral pulses, again, I explained this two weeks ago, feel the femoral pulse, because if you've got coarctation, you need to rule it out. If you leave coarctation and it presents in dominant heart failure, you've left it too late and you've caused huge morbidity to a child. Uh, look at the spine. So spine for tufts of hair, swelling or nevus, indicative of a spina bifida, much more sensitive than asking the mum if they were taking their folate in pregnancy. Okay, have a good look, have a feel. Um, okay, if you're going to think Patau, Patau syndrome, uh, look, you're going to have a lot more clues if it's Patau. Everyone needs to calm down. Okay, we're not like looking at super rare. I'm just trying to keep it simple here. If you're thinking Patau, Patau syndrome, if, for those who don't know, it's a very complicated chromosomal abnormality. Um, huge mortality in utero. And if you get one that is alive, you'll know about it very soon. And you won't be looking for the extra digit as the clue for Patel because it'll be there, you know, you'll be, you'll have clues everywhere. The, the single, the extra digit is not going to be the giveaway. Um, spina bifida. So just have a real good feel of the spine. Look for the hair. Uh, hips. So we'll talk about Barlow and Ortolani. Um, and then genitalia, hypospadias in, and testes and scrotum, make sure they're not undescended. Uh, virilization of the female can be life-threatening, okay? And this was super interesting, taught to me by a very old-fashioned consultant um, at St. Peter's. Um, and I think it's super important that you know, because this is something you can look out for. And if you pick it up and someone else doesn't pick it up, it could be life-saving. Um, and the anus, you want to look at, uh, is it patent or is it imperfect? Because you need to make sure that, you know, if a baby doesn't pass stool, that it's not because they've got an imperfect anus that needs surgical management. Um, and it, it is super important to examine on every child. So if you just go on menti.com and enter that code and see what your answer would be for why virilization of female genitalia might be a life-threatening condition. Uh, let me open the, open the, okay. I think you can vote on it now. Okay, I'll show the results at like 75. Um, and with your question about congenital cataract, uh, I'm not 100% certain because my ophthalmology is incredibly poor. Um, I will be the first to admit that. So maybe look it up um, to be sure. I'm not sure about the incidence of these conditions. I would. You know, an educated guess would be, yes, it's more common than retinoblastoma because retinoblastoma is rare, um, but I can't be 100% certain. Okay, let's have a look. So in which life-threatening condition can female virilization be the first sign of renal agenesis, hypothyroidism, Potter's, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or neuroblastoma? And good, 70% of you got that right. Um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Okay, so Congenital adrenal hyperplasia, for those of you who don't know, is can be caused by enzyme deficiency in the adrenals in terms of production of corticosteroids um, and uh, aldosterone. And what it can do is that ephemeral pulse thing, well, if someone has coarctation of the aorta, you're not going to have a femoral pulse. Um, or you're not going to, be able to feel femoral, femoral pulses. Um, so the congenital adrenal hyperplasia, you're going to have increased production of uh, androgens, right? So testosterone and, and its um, uh, similar molecules. And as a result, you will have an inability to develop female genitalia. It will have a mass, you have a masculinization of the female genitalia. Now, why is this life-threatening? Well, in that stage, it's not life-threatening. But if the neonate goes on and it's unable to produce cortisol, you essentially have Addison's disease and they could go into Addisonian crisis, which can of course be a fatal condition. And if you can pick up at the baby check, there's virilization of the genitalia, you can pick up early that there may be some need to investigate um, the adrenal uh, enzymes. Okay, I hope that all makes sense. Um, but again, it, is, it sounds so trivial. It sounds like, oh, do I really need to do this? The parents here, like, you know, it's, it's not the most glamorous thing for a baby. They want to play cute and like, you know, hold their hands and stuff. But you actually need to take the nappy off and have a look at the front and have a look at the back. And it's just important. And it's not one of those nice things, but, um, but it, can, it can save the child. 
Okay, and again, important for GP as well, important for GP life, because that can give you a really good uh, heads up and A&E. So let's talk about hips, okay? So hips quickly, um, you're gonna do these two tests for, this is the clearest diagram I could find of the tests for uh, the hips, okay? So you're gonna look for developmental dysplasia of the hip, okay? Which is a condition where, um, well, anyway, let's talk about the, the examination first quickly. So what you're gonna do with the Barlow's test is you're gonna internally rotate the hip and you're gonna push down. And you can see that you're in an attempt to posteriorly dislocate the uh, acetabulum, the femoral head from the acetabulum, okay? You're, you're trying to posteriorly dislocate it. If it dislocates, you will feel it with a clunk, all right? Now this looks horrible. I've done it on a neonate actually. I did it on a neonate a couple months ago um, during a taster week and I was absolutely scared. Like I was terrified of hurting the baby because it was so cute. The parents were there and I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to try and like, I'm gonna have to try and dislocate your hip to show if it's in or not. Um, but actually they take it really well. And I don't think too many babies actually cry or feel too much from it. So that's quite a nice feeling. Um, and if you push down, it will either feel rock solid or it'll clunk out. Now, how do you confirm it's clunked out? Well, that's where the Ortolani's test comes in. And that's just a confirmation. So if you've got a Barlow's positive, if you think there's a Barlow's, but you're not 100% sure, then you can do Ortolani's to put it back in, okay? And that's when you externally rotate and you sort of abduct the thigh um, and it, the femoral head will reduce into the acetabulum and you'll get a clunk. So you'll have two clunks, okay? And that's from Barlow's and Ortolani's and that just confirms what's going on. What happens if you do Ortolani's and the hip doesn't go back in? Well, <laughs> then you call the orthopedic surgeon. No, no, it, it should, it, it should, because naturally there's enough ligaments and muscles trying to pull it back towards the joint. So if you can Barlow's it, you can Ortolani's it, okay? If you can take it, if you can put it out, you've got to be able to put it back in because there's more stuff helping you put it back in than there is helping you put it out. Um, our Ortolani test is just a confirmation that the hip was dislocated in Barlow's. I, I remember med school people just got a little bit confused. Um, I think you, would, you won't need to do it as an FY1, um, but certainly as an FY2. If you've got an FY2 peds job, you're the one who goes to deliveries and does the baby check and things like that. So you need to be able to actually do one. I mean, there are models. My med school had a model where we tried it on a plastic baby, which didn't feel realistic at all. But you, and the clunk actually sounds really realistic in the models. Um, just get an appreciation for what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what you're looking for uh, with all these tests. I wouldn't teach something if it was completely pointless and you only need to do it if you were like an orthopedic surgeon or pediatric consultant. This is kind of something you might need to do as an F2. And it's something you might need to do if, you know, you've got, uh, if you're a GP or an A&E and you've got a, a child with hip pain or who's not mobilizing properly, for example, or the leg looks funny. No, normal hip, normal hip will not dislocate. Okay, a normal hip will be rock solid in the joint. If you've got developmental dysplasia of the hip, then the uh, femoral head will pop out the back and posteriorly dislocate. Right, so the, uh, developmental dysplasia of the hip, say, how many times can I say it in one go? I should probably just stop, stop saying it. 90% of them are female, 20% have a family history, and 30% are breach presentation. And there are more, they are more common if you have a neuromuscular disorder, like you know, muscular atrophies and things like that, um, which, which is logical. Interestingly, how female dominant the condition is, um, and the breach presentation makes sense, doesn't it? Because of the positioning of the baby and the amount of um, you know, trauma, might, how difficult the delivery might be. Um, so if it's a positive test, you do an ultrasound and you review them with an orthopedic surgeon. And that's it. That's all you need to do as an FY or as a GP. You don't need to do anything more than that. They can use special harnesses and things like that to help the hip develop in the right way. Yeah, so the Barlow, so I should specify this. Barlow's test is the one you do. Okay, you do a Barlow's. If it feels rock solid, then for the sake of appearances, you just do an ortolani just to make sure you haven't accidentally dislocated it and, and forgotten or not heard it properly, okay? But 99.999% of the time, if you do a Barlow's and dislocate, you'll know about it, all right? So Barlow's first, ortolani is just to confirm and put the hip back. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why that time frame is. I wouldn't worry too much about that. I'm sure the guidelines are different everywhere, to be honest. Um, they, they do need an ultrasound. I'm not sure how long. What does a clunk sound like? You know what? I've got this Vaseline here. It probably sounds a bit like this. Wait. Oh no, that wasn't loud enough. Okay, I, I don't have anything that could sound like it, but it's a, it's a clunk. It's a real like clunk. Um, I mean, if you don't know what clunk sounds like, maybe YouTube clunk and just listen to loads of clunks, I guess it kind of sounds like that. Um, okay, fine. 
So we've done hips, we've done the examination, we've done neonatal resuscitation. Let's talk about hearts. Now, this is my area of interest. I, and, and I'll say this to you now, like you may be watching all this and be like, oh, I hate all this stuff. And I did too in second year, I could not understand congenital heart disease, but I found it absolutely fascinating during my BSc. And then I just, I, complete, I completely love it. Like, I think it's so interesting now, um, even though I don't want to fangirl too much about it and be that annoying guy. It's really, really, really cool. And it's one of the last things, you know, truly old school types of disease that still exist because we treat so much so well prophylactically. This is something that actually needs intervention. And I think it's really interesting. So you need to be able to appreciate with congenital heart disease, what happens at delivery. Okay, so at delivery, you need to be able to see what happens. So in the fetal life, you've got blood coming in from the placenta through the duct ductus venosus, as you can see in diagram A. Okay, this is the clearest diagram I could find. The blood then goes, it doesn't need to go up the right ventricle. Okay, there's no, there's no need to inflate the lungs. So the, you've got a patent for amino valley, okay, across the right atrium to the left atrium. So blood will just shunt across because it's already oxygenated from the mother, from the placenta, into the left atrium, left ventricle, round to your systemic circulation, right? Any blood that does go up, uh, it can go through the, you know, you get a, small, a trivial amount through the pulmonary arteries, but some of it will just go straight across the ductus arteriosus into the arterial tree, okay? So there's the difference. You've got three points of difference in the fetal heart. When it comes to the adult heart, things change, okay? So what happens over the course of days, hours, days, weeks, depends on your physiology, they all vary. You get that ductus venosus turns into your ligamentum teres, it's like around your liver, I think. Um, then your ductus arteriosus will close off and your foramen ovale will shut, okay, across the atria. So here we go. So you've got low pulmonary pressures, foramen ovale and ductus arteriosus allow blood to shunt in fetal life. Then when you move to birth, your lungs will inflate. And this is the key. Like lungs inflating is the most important part about life, okay? If your lungs inflate properly, you will be a healthy baby. If your lungs do not inflate properly, you will have real trouble as a baby. And I think it's one of the most amazing, it's one of the most interesting things about neonatology. So your lungs inflate, your pulmonary pressures will increase. Pulmonary, you know, uh, your, your uh, alveolar pressures, your arterial pressures, your venous pressures, it all increases, okay? Therefore, your left atrial pressures increase because they force more blood um, through the left atria, okay? As a result, the foramen ovale shuts because the, because the way the leaflets are, shut, are, are placed, it's like a valve. And once the pressure in the left atrium increases, it doesn't, it closes and it doesn't allow shunting from left atria to right atria in a healthy person. In addition to that, your, uh, your pulmonary artery pressures increase and your ductus arteriosus shuts through a number of, uh, you know, the change in oxygen tension in the blood and, you know, uh, thromboxane, things like that they change and nitric oxide they they change the way your ductus arteriosus works and it's very very poorly understood um so it's, it's a really interesting you know, also interesting part of the part of the heart so all that shuts okay so you get this transformation into the adult heart or what will become the adult heart is that clear i don't want to leave anyone on this slide thinking i don't know what's happening and then i have to pick it up in a few slides because it, it's more difficult does that make sense you've got three points of difference essentially and two worth actually concentrating on let me just have a look at messages okay everyone everyone calm down about everyone everyone calm down about okay prostaglandin infusions again beyond the scope you do not need to worry you are not the f1 or f2 going to be there starting prostaglandin infusion okay just everyone everyone chill a little bit all right um okay can you repeat that okay which bit would you like me to repeat Fetal, circul fetal circulation, blood comes in by the placenta, oxygenated from the mother, okay, from the ductus venosus, goes into the um, uh, right atrium and right ventricle, okay, sorry, right atrium, from the right atrium, it will shunt across the foramen ovale, which is patent because the right atrial pressures are greater than left atrial pressures at this point, and the blood will shunt straight across, okay, if it doesn't shunt across, it goes through the right ventricle, it goes up the, um, through the pulmonary valve, and it will shunt across the ductus arteriosus into the arteries. Any other blood will go through the pulmonary tree and come back through the left side. So you're essentially passing the uh, pulmonary circulation because you don't need it there. You need blood in your heart and you need blood in your brain and you need blood in your kidneys in the fetal life because that's what's developing more. Your lungs don't need to develop until you are 
close to birth if not, and, and beyond that. Okay, so that's fetal circulation. What time did the foramen ovale and ductus ulterioris? So that in theory, it all varies, okay? So the foramen ovale in theory should shut as soon as you oxygenate because you should then increase your left atrial pressures, which should shut the valve, okay? It should shut the foramen ovale and then you should have no communication between the two arteries and there can be an error and we'll, we'll talk about that later, okay? The ductus ulterioris is more complicated. It can take, it can happen immediately. It can take hours. It can take days. It cannot close at all, okay? In some people, and we don't know why, because it's multifactorial why it's shut. And if you want to know more, you can ask. It was my whole BSc project, um, and it was a real pain. And then at the end of it, I realized no one actually knows any of it, so it was more interesting that way. Um, so I'm not going to pretend to tell you there's one definite rule for half of this stuff, because anyone who does say that is lying. Right. I'm going to move on. So congenital heart disease. So you can stratify now. Now that was all theory, and it was to get you to appreciate what's going on and understand. Because I don't think you can answer an SBA without having an idea of what's actually happening in the heart. We stratify congenital heart disease into two forms. So it's acyanotic, right? So acyanotic conditions present not with cyanosis. Acyanotic. Okay. So these babies are pink and well perfused most of the time. Left to right shunts give you this. Okay. So essentially, acyanotic means the blood is going through the pulmonary circulation, but then it's just coming back to the right side of the heart, okay? So you get more blood flowing through the right side because a little bit is diverting away from the left ventricle or left atrium into the right side of the heart and recirculating. But everything is oxygenated, right? Because everything goes to the lungs. So everything is oxygenated, all right? So you can get a couple, you know, so left to right shunts and then obstruction. So pulmonary stenosis, uh, coarctation of the aorta, aortic stenosis, hyperplastic left heart, which is a bit more complex, so don't worry about that. This traditionally presents with breathlessness and poor feeding. Okay, so the baby will have a tough time feeding. And then heart, you know, heart conditions, a lot of them will present with poor feeding early in life and maybe a murmur. Um, so the breathlessness is because you have increased pulmonary pressures. All right, not because the blood is deoxygenated. That's a key point to make. Yeah. Um, cyanotic conditions, it's when these present when the ductus arteriosus closes, okay, and you've got right to left shunts. So the blood is bypassing the pulmonary circulation. It's not even reaching the lung. So it's going to reach the in systemic circulation without oxygen. And that's when you get, uh, you know, a cyan peripheral and central cyanosis. Um, you can get common mixing conditions as well. So I like to think about it in this format. And I, I, I saw a YouTube video after I graduated, actually, um, just by, I don't know why I was looking at it, but I found one. And I thought it was a really good way of learning it. So one, two, three, four, five, okay? One, truncus arteriosus, okay? Where you have one common tree. Our pulmonary artery and aorta are one vessel. So you get common mixing, okay? And like that's, you remember that's one vessel coming out of the heart, one main outflow vessel, okay? Two is transposition. The two main arteries are switched, okay? So that's transposition of the great arteries, giving you two sets of circulation. So you have a systemic circulation around one side of the heart, and you have a pulmonary circulation around the other side of the heart. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So don't, don't worry about that just yet. So tricuspid atresia. If you've got tricuspid atresia, you are relying on uh, blood shunting across the uh, foramen ovale or an ASD. Okay, across the atria to get to the systemic circulation. It misses the lungs because it can't get from right atrium to right ventricle. And three for tricuspid. And then four is for tetralogy of fallow. And we'll talk about tetralogy. It's a really interesting condition later. Um, and then for the show offs, number five is the five worded total anomalous pulmonary venous return. Don't ask me about it. I don't know too much about it. You do not need to know about it for your finals. Don't ask me any questions. Uh, in real life tips, okay? In real life, and not, and not in SBAs kind of criminally, Neonates can have a lot of comorbidities. They can have a lot of congen other congenital heart defects, okay? A kid with transposition can also have an AVSD, okay? A kid with tricuspid atresia could also have hyperplastic left heart with a tricuspid. You can have as many of these as you want in one go, okay? So don't think that just because it's tr the diagnosis is, is truncus arteriosus, you can't have anything else going on. And in fact, there's a higher risk of having something else if you've got one of these already. So let's talk about tetralogy. This is a really, so there's two common conditions that you really should learn about, tetralogy and uh, transposition, okay? So tetralogy of fallow is this, is this, is this tetra, okay? It's four uh, defects, okay? And you can imagine it in a certain way. You can imagine this in a certain way, okay? So you have 
a ventricular septal defect. Sorry, you have a, a pulmonary stenosis or an atresia of the valve. Atresia means a failure to form of the valve. You have a right ventricle that is struggling because it can't output anything, okay? This doesn't allow the ventricular septum to develop in a healthy way. So you get a ventricular septal defect, okay? The aorta overrides that VSD. And as a result, this huge right ventricular strain early in life, you get right ventricular hypertrophy. Does that make sense? Everything kind of leads on from one. It's not like remembering four, if I give you four random things to remember, they kind of all lead in to each other, okay? And this will cause a cyanotic heart defect because look, you've got a lot of that blue blood going straight up to the aorta because it can't get through the pulmonary circulation. And you can have varying degrees of tetralogy. Um, so the presentation is variable, okay? Severe cases can happen the first few days. Some can take weeks to months. In an exams, you will have a kid with a cyanosis and a pulmonary murmur around two months of age, six, eight weeks, two months, okay? That's what will happen in an exam question. But in real life, as a GP or an a &E doc, I want you to bear this in mind. If you see any kid who looks even slightly blue, all right? It can present a lot later in life. You've got this ejection of systolic murmur at the left sternal edge, clubbing, traditionally clubbing with tetralogy is quite a popular finding. Um, I don't know how common that is in the neonatal phase, but, uh, but I just put it there so that you know. Uh, on the chest x-ray, you get this classically described boot-shaped heart, okay? Um, and I mean, obviously I think everyone wears different shaped boots to what I'll show you in a minute. Management is surgery at six months, okay? Um, and don't worry about which surgeries, there's a, there's a complicated surgery that varies on what exact anatomy you have and what other comorbidities you have. And there's a boot-shaped heart for you. So it's essentially you seeing the right ventricular hypertrophy um, is giving you that boot shape. Let me just have a quick look in case someone's asking any questions. Repeat the four steps and how they cause each other. Okay, okay, okay. Um, right, so, uh, okay, so you have a pulmonary valve that is stenosed or atretic. Okay, now your right ventricle is having huge strain and that may cause your ventricular septum to not develop properly, okay? That means that you get a VSD. Now, the right ventricle has the aorta overriding that VSD. Not entirely sure why that happens, but you can naturally imagine that that kind of anatomy benefits output of the heart because otherwise you'd die earlier in life, perhaps, if you didn't have the overriding aorta. And as a result of that huge right heart strain over the course of weeks and months, you're gonna have right ventricular hypertrophy, okay? So there's your tetralogy. Um, why does surgery, yeah, that's, that's probably fair. You do not wanna do, sur you wanna do surgery as late as you can in these kids, I think. I mean, I'm sure the surgery, I'm giving that six months as a general rule that you don't rush them straight to theater. It's not like a, an emergency procedure, but if a kid is really cyanotic and the anatomy is such, they might need more, they might need more urgent operation. There's no hard and fast rules in congenital heart disease surgery. Everything, everything I'm teaching you today is a, in a learning phase. Like none of this stuff existed 20, well, to be fair, this existed, 20, okay, fine. It did exist 20 years ago, but it's advancing at such a rate and there's such little evidence that a lot of this stuff is changing very quickly. There's very little evidence for anything in neonatology. All the trials are small, amazingly retrospective, not many controls because of the ethics, as you can imagine, of denying someone treatment or using experimental treatments. So a lot of this is anecdotal, physiological, and scaled down from adults, okay? Uh, if an adult told you that a hole in the heart, which is patched up as a baby, that could be anything. That could be an ASD, it could be a VSD, it could be an AVSD. Um, it could be any, any number of things. Ejection systolic murmur is what ESM stands for. Okay, um, right. Okay, so, uh, oh, you can give me my feedback. You can just get the slides after and do the feedback on them because I'll leave the QR code on it, but that's very kind of you. Right, transposition of the great arteries. Okay, this is a complicated one and it took me a long time to really, really wrap my head around it. Essentially, the aorta connects to the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery connects to the left ventricle. So this is not good, okay? As you can imagine, this is bad. This is bad news bears for this baby, all right? It will give you profound cyanosis early on. No murmurs, no clinical signs, okay? This baby relies on one thing. If you, for the, you know, the, the, the ones amongst you who will realize this very quickly are that now you have two sets of circulation. Your right ventricle is supplying your whole body 
Okay, blood's coming back from the body and going to the body. And your left ventricle is only supplying the lungs. All right? Now, you might think for a second, hang on, that's not right, because the right ventricle is very thin. It's not designed to sustain systemic pressure, is it? So this is really bad. The right ventricle will become maladapted and undergo horrible hypertrophy and damage early in life if you can't pick this up, okay? These babies will survive because of a shunt. Because you've got the systemic circulation, the systemic circulation has no way to get oxygen unless there is an ASD, there is a VSD, or there is a patent ductus arteriosus, all right? The reason it presents within hours is because these infants can have an open ductus arteriosus for six, 12 hours, a couple of days maybe. And then when that shuts, there's no shunt between the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. There's no way to get from systemic to pulmonary circulations and they will become profoundly cyanotic. Um, the chest x-ray shows an egg on side appearance. Now I looked at it and I think it's a bit, I think it's a bit ropey. So I haven't put it in here um, because I don't really, like, I, I don't think it looks too much different to, to this, to be honest. When I look at it, I couldn't, convin I couldn't convincingly tell you which one was which, if I was being honest. Um, so I've left out. So this is the procedure that can be done, which is life-saving in these cases, right? It's called a balloon atrial septostomy, and it's really cool. So you, under fluoroscopic guidance, so that's like a look, an X-ray, like a live X-ray, okay? How you do an interventional radi many interventional radiology procedures. You advance a balloon catheter up the femoral vein, okay, all the way up to the right atrium, you pass it across the right atrium, you make a hole in the right atrium, or you go through the foramen ovale, which may not close at this point. You inflate a balloon in the left atrium, and then you just rip it through. And when you rip it through, you create a hole. So it's an atrial septostomy with a balloon, right? It's kind of simple, but that shunt, you're essentially making an ASD. You make the shunt that keeps the circulations mixed, and saves the life of the baby before they can have a definitive surgery, okay? And, oh no, I haven't mentioned it. So the definitive surgery, and I should have mentioned it, is, a, uh, is an atrial switch procedure, okay? So surgically, and a switch of the atria, um, so that you've got the, uh, sorry, did I say atria? I meant arterial switch, okay? So you're doing a switch of the pulmonary artery back to the uh, pulmonary valve, and the aorta back to the aortic valve, okay? Sorry, it's a bit of a bit complicated to say. Is that all clear? That's, that's transposition. So transposition is the early cyanosis and tetralogy will give you slightly later cyanosis, okay? There's your sort of SBA tip for cyanotic heart disease. Uh, what would SATs present with the legs? They can be anything, they should drop, they will drop quickly and they will drop suddenly. When the duct, so the duct, when the duct, so in this case, the ductus arteriosus is all that's keeping the, um, aorta, uh, sorry, the right side of the heart connected to the left side of the heart. It's the only thing that connects systemic and pulmonary circulation. So if the ductus arteriosus is shut because the baby has reached an age, the oxygen tension has increased, it's all physiological, then you will um, end up with uh, profound hypoxia straight away. And the SATs can drop to 80, 70, 60 um, quite quickly, okay? How often is hyperoxia? So I haven't mentioned the hyperoxia test because it's kind of textbook thing. I'm, I don't want to explain it because I don't really understand. Hyperoxia test is when you put someone on 15 liters of oxygen for a period of time, and you essentially wash all the nitrogen out of their blood. And if they are still cyanotic, or that their saturation, sorry, are still not, uh, they're still below, is it 92, 90, 98 or something, then you can diagnose them as having cyanotic heart disease. I don't understand what the point is. I mean, most people I would imagine just get a, an echo or a V scanner and just have a, like an actual look. I, I don't really know how, how, how often I can't, can't actually tell you, I'm sorry. Okay, let's keep moving. So long-term, so that's important to know. I'm telling you about life-saving things and things that you're gonna get examined on and I don't want you to miss as an A&E GP pediatrician, okay? Long-standing left to right shunts. Now we did talk about ASDs and VSDs and AVSDs and PDAs causing a left to right shunt. So you get oxygenated blood recirculating to the pulmonary, to pulmonary vasculature, okay? So it sounds pretty harmless and it is, relatively speaking to cyanotic heart disease, it is a bit less dangerous, but you need to be careful with this, okay? If you pick up a murmur on a, in a GP, and this is so common as a GP, in a, as a four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, eight-year-old, 10-year-old, you need to be listening. And if you hear the murmur, you need to consider, could this be an ASD or a VSD? I haven't listed all the murmurs because I don't want you to be looking, using this as a rote revision session, okay? Um, learning all the murmurs. I mean, they all present with slightly blowy injection systolic murmurs in different places. 
um, and it's just something worth considering. BSD, PDA, ASD, and AVSD. So if you've got a long-standing left to right shunt, you increase your pulmonary blood flow, okay? Increased pulmonary pressure as a result of this occurs, okay? So the pulmonary vascular becomes a bit more muscular. You know, it, it adapts. Vasculature is not a static thing. It's not just piping, it adapts. The right ventricle we think is a pretty inert thing, but it can adapt and become hypertrophic. The pulmonary vasculature the same can become you know, much more muscular and adapt to the pressures because it needs to sustain it, otherwise it will rupture, okay? Pulmonary pressure can grow and grow and grow, and this can then exceed systemic pressure, okay? Once pulmonary pressure exceeds systemic pressure, you now have a problem, okay? Because that means your right-sided heart pressures are now gonna exceed your left-sided heart pressures. Your ASD or your VSD, which has been you know, pumping blood harmlessly from left to right the whole time, are now, with simple physics, right? Pressure moves from high to low, are now going to reverse. So you get shunt reversal and you get a right to left shunt, okay? Because the pressures in the pulmonary vascular is so high, you get a right to left shunt from your VSD. That leads to cyanosis. And that then, you know, that can be terminal. At this point, it's essentially, you know, you're hoping for a miracle and you do not want to miss this as a GP or as an A&E doc or anything, okay? Because the right heart is not designed for this pressure, not day in, day out, maybe for a few days in neonatal life, a few days as a child, but not, not for you know, years and years and years. These become irreversible. So your maladaptations, your thick musculature become irreversible and leads to right heart failure. Right heart failure is bad, 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 okay? And then comes death, okay? And this whole time, how long does this take? 40 years, 30 years, 25 years? No, you're looking at teenager. Okay, so you do not want teenagers dying of this, of this phenomenon. So listen to the murmur and make sure none of this stuff is present because you wanna ensure that you do not, you're not the one who has this. Um, and the name of this phenomenon is called Eisenmenger syndrome. Okay, so a reversal of a left to right shunt after a long period of time because of raised pulmonary blood pressure. Do not miss it. Is that clear? I, I mean, this is super complicated. It took me a while to understand. I've tried to break it down as much as I can. Okay, neonatal jaundice. So neonatal jaundice quickly. So neonates are prone to developing jaundice. Okay, 50% of neonates will become jaundiced to some degree at some point, which is which is quite a lot when you think about it, you know. And, and this can be this can be a cause for concern for a lot of parents. Um, I've just realized, I'm just I think I've made a meme for this and I've deleted the slide. I'm really sad. Okay, never mind. Um, 50 cent neonates will come jaundice to some degree. Physiological reasons. There are normal reasons for this. Okay? It can be very normal. So there's a few reasons. So you've got high hemoglobin concentrations at birth. Okay, so when you have cell turnover, you get a huge release of hemoglobin. And as you know, bilirubin is one of the breakdown products of hemoglobin. The red blood cell lifespan of a neonate is only 70 days. Okay, does anyone know what the adult lifespan is? So 70 days is, is pretty short. Yeah, 100, okay, you guys are straight in there. Um, very good, you all paid more attention than me in first year. So 120 days, exactly. So if you've got a shorter lifespan of a red blood cell, you're gonna need a faster way to metabolize that hemoglobin and you know, deal with the bilirubin. And the third phenomenon is that you've got underdeveloped neonatal bilirubin metabolism. Okay, early in life, your liver is a little bit naive and doesn't have the enzyme reserves you need to conjugate bilirubin and excrete bilirubin effectively. So there's three reasons to get jaundice. Okay, so you have, you have a, a child who is now prone to getting jaundice. So let's see what else can happen. Okay, why, why is it important? So jaundice, you know, bilirubin goes high. It's okay, your liver's, your liver's not functioning badly. It's not because you're an alcoholic or you've got you know, hepatitis. Like why, why should we be worried about, you know, abnormal jaundice? Well, the bilirubin itself can be very dangerous to the neonatal and developing brain, okay? So bilirubin can cross the blood-brain barrier. And when it does so, it deposits favorably in the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia, for those of you who read about Parkinson's in second year, will know that it's all about fine control. And it's a very important part of development. Okay, very, very important part of development. This can become neurotoxic if it's not noticed early. Okay, so you can get irritability or feeling difficulties, and it can be a spectrum all the way up to seizures, coma, deaths. And even if you survive, you know, you pick it up when your baby is having a seizure or something, 
you can be left with cerebral palsy, learning difficulties, hearing loss, impaired development is almost a given, speech, those, those things can all happen quite readily um, if you do not notice uh, high bilirubin, okay? So there's a neonatal brain uh, with basal ganglia, uh, and there you can see the yellow staining of the jaundice, okay? So that's what happened, that baby seized and died uh, because no one noticed the jaundice. Okay, I'm joking. Okay, it's not a baby, it's a cat. Um, that was, this is post-mortem of a cat, so don't freak out. Um, but you can see, I thought it was a really good illustration of what actually happens so that you can appreciate that the bilirubin deposition is, is actually you know, visible to the naked eye on post-mortem, okay? Uh, right, so here's a basic overview of what happens to uh, your bilirubin. Uh, you can see breakdown of hemoglobin. You've got unconjugated bilirubin flooding the bloodstream bound to albumin, but obviously in a neonate, you, you're just developing albumin production is not your primary concern. So you can't even bind too much to the bilirubin. And then it can freely cross the blood brain barrier unless you can conjugate it effectively in the liver and pass it through into your biliary tree and gut, okay? And then you do have a degree of enteropathic recirculation uh, into the uh, liver and kidneys again. Right, so John, let me just actually have a quick look at some questions. Does anyone ask a question? Is this the same as Parkinsonism? No, because the child's brain isn't, um, isn't uh, well, it's not an adult brain. Okay, you know what? I'm not going to explain this because I don't have a PhD in Parkinson's disease, but no, they don't get Parkinsonism because they haven't developed the initial skills to show Parkinsonism is the simplest way I can put it, okay? They will show child difficulties with cerebral palsy, uh, with um, basal ganglia, not adult difficulties with basal ganglia. Okay, jaundice in the first 24 hours of life. This is what you need to focus on. Do not miss this. This is important in your finals or you know, your, your pediatric exam. This is the stuff to pay attention to. It's virtually always pathological, especially in exam questions. Okay, you need a full workup for hemolysis. I'm not gonna go through every single cause in depth because you, you should know this and you'll be, you'll be you know, all across your hematology and pathology exams. You know, so the cause of hemolysis in the neonate in SBA's rhesus disease is something well worth considering. In real life, okay, because of anti-D being given to rhesus negative mothers, this is actually a lot less common than other antibodies. Now it makes up less, less than half of all hemolytic, uh, autoimmune hemolytic diseases in, um, in the neonatal period. So anti-C and anti-KEL antibodies are actually a more common blood type to get um, uh, hemolysis with than rhesus. I just thought that was interesting. Um, and you can do a DAT, and that'll be DAT positive, a direct anti, uh, direct anti-globulin test. Uh, ABO incompatibility. So type O mother can have anti-A antibodies. If you've got a type A or AB father, those can pass through the placenta, and in the neonatal period, in the first 24 hours, they can cause um, hemolysis. Okay. G6PD, again, hemolysis, spherocytosis, pyruvate kinase deficiency. And again, congenital infection. Infection can cause jaundice at any point in the neonatal period or even the young life period, okay? If it's severe enough. So that's what you need to work out for. Hemolysis, first 24 hours, I must rule out hemolysis. Should be the kind of thing you approach the exam for. Jaundice in exams is all about the time frame. okay? 24 hours, 24 hours to two weeks, and two weeks plus. That's how you should break it up. That's how I've broken it down today for you. Right, jaundice 24 hours to two weeks. So. Commonly, you have benign causes. At this point, you are not worried about the child. Bear in mind that the bilirubin can still go to a dangerous level. Even though the, the cause is benign, the bilirubin can still go to a dangerous level. So it's still important to address the bilirubin before you get conicterous, right? Breastfeeding jaundice is really common, really, really common. It's not well understood. People think that breast milk may increase the enteropathic circulation of bilirubin, okay? Dehydration. Uh, so feeding difficult, so feeding the baby with the breast, not feeding the baby with the breast, it can always cause jaundice, okay? If you've got bruising, any area of bruising, like a, a pocket of blood with a blood breakdown, a huge, essentially bolus of hemolysis can then cause transient jaundice. You need to investigate things for infection, especially UTIs. UTIs can present like this because UTIs have hydration, dehydration, um, and they can cause another number of other changes in the body that can lead to predisposition for jaundice. Polycythemia. Uh, liver enzyme defects, so Gilbert's and for the show-offs again, Kriglin Najjar, uh, and metabolic disorder, so galactosemia. Um, maybe something worth, if you really have time, just have a two-minute read about galactosemia. 
it's an inability to break down galactose, which is one of the sugars um, found in milk, uh, I think breast milk as well. So essentially it can compound on top of breastfeeding jaundice and it can be one of the first signs. What do you do about bilirubin? Okay, so measure it properly. So transcutaneous levels are something you may have learned about, but you need to get a serum level and you need to plot it on the chart. Then you're also gonna do these blood tests. I've, list, just, I've just listed them all for you. So you can kind of copy and paste if you want. Um, and then you need to plot it on the chart. And this chart is all that matters, okay? The chart tells you what to do at each age and at each bilirubin level. And it shows you the threshold to treat. And if you put it in the preterm on the Excel spreadsheet, it will lower it. Hospitals will have this stuff. GP surgeries will have this stuff. So here you go. Okay, so all you do is you look at how many days from birth they are, and then you plot their serum bilirubin level. And it tells you which of the two, if any, interventions you need to be uh, putting them in for. Okay. So phototherapy, UV light in the blue range. Okay. You cover the baby's eyes because it can be quite disruptive and, um, and, and distressing for the baby with uh, a little mask or a headset. Okay. And that can cover the eyes from the UV light. And then this UV breaks down the bilirubin into uh, urines, uh, things which can be excreted in the urine. And therefore you can completely bypass the liver. All right. So that's a really good way to get rid of someone who's got a bit, a bit of a high bilirubin. Exchange transfusion is a lot more complex. So you don't wanna leave it too late because if you have to exchange transfuse, there is more morbidity and mortality from the transfusion because of what you're doing. So it's not just a transfusion, it's an exchange transfusion. What you're doing is you're taking the blood rich in bilirubin out of the neonate and you're transfusing in blood from a donor that obviously has no bilirubin in it. So that's a really last, that's the last ditch effort. Okay, you do not wanna get near that because that's, that's pretty drastic treat. That's a medieval treatment, isn't it really? Okay, so in an exchange transfusion, for those of you interested, you do two times 90 mil per kilogram uh, of blood removed, and then you transfuse an equal amount in. I don't know if you do it at the same time. I'm imagining you do it at the same time. It wouldn't make sense otherwise. This removes the bilirubin. It removes the antibodies. It's maybe causing hemolysis, and it corrects uh, your anemia if you've got hemolytic anemia, okay? So that's a much more drastic option. So those are your two treatments and when you treat for, uh, and this was my pacer station in fifth year. Um, and I did stress, cause I, I looked at it, I knew the theory, but I had to like triple check the chart. Cause I was like, am I, am I messing it up? Like, am I putting it in the wrong place? Um, so just get comfortable with, with understanding how this chart works. I'm sure many of you will be cleverer than me and not need to look at it more than once. Uh, someone is ruining my slides and talking about biliary atresia, which makes me really sad. Cause I was about to talk about that. Um, Okay, torch and uh, sepsis. Talk about sepsis. Yeah, sepsis can cause um, high bilirubin at any point. Okay, so if your baby is septic, they've got bigger problems, but you do need to include the bilirubin as part of that and correct that. So jaundice beyond two weeks of age. Okay, so I've got a question for you. All right, what's the most important symptom or sign to find on examination or ask the parents about in prolonged jaundice? Okay. I've opened the Mentimeter uh, question. There's the code, codes on the, um, on the slide. Let's give you a minute to get into that. You guys are a lot less keen to answer this one. To be fair, the questions from last week, you guys were really on it. Like it was 120 responses every time. I think you guys kind of can't be bothered this time. All right, fair enough. Um, just have a go, just have a go. And let's see what we come up with. I'd be interested to see what you guys think. When I ask in a history, I'm always trying to think of like, what's the value I can get for every question I ask? I don't ask, or I try my best. I do, I do witter on sometimes, but I try my best to add value to every question I ask. And I find, and I think with jaundice, this question tells me more than just about any question could about the liver, um, really. 
Uh, and I think it's super important that maybe you incorporate. I remember teaching this to um, young years when I was doing OSCE tutoring in third year. And I was just like in fourth year, and I was just saying that, you know, you need to have a high value question. And for a pacer station, when you're asking an anxious mum, asking these questions really helps me stratify jaundice um, in these cases. So let's see what you've said. Good, excellent, excellent. A lot of you, a lot of you have got this bang on. Okay, so dark urine and pale stools. Okay, this is a sign of obstructive jaundice. Okay, so this is a sign, if I show you the, if you look at this, this is a sign of an issue. I don't know if you can see my, uh, let me put a pen up here. So this is a sign of jaundice occurring because of an issue in this part of the system. All right. Okay, so let's talk about it. I'm really happy you all got it. So that's a really high value question. If you're in your OSCE station and you think feeling a bit, you know, pushed for time and you're like not sure what the jaundice is going, why not ask this question? Because it's so high value. It literally immediately cuts out and a super important diagnosis to exclude, okay? So there's some dark urine for you. It will be anywhere from dehydrated to Coca-Cola colored. You can do bilirubin dip on the urine. Well, I think you can send it to the lab and, and check for bilirubin and pale stools. The stools will look like, you know, anemic clay, like really pale, um, you know, like someone's taken a picture of a poo and put it in black and white on a printer. It, you know, it will look like that or it can be maybe light yellow. Um, you get a raised conjugated bilirubin in the blood. This is, again, super important to look at, right, for obstructive jaundice conjugated again means you've got a problem after the liver the liver is conjugating but it's backed up so much that it's now leaking conjugated bilirubin into the bloodstream so when a neonate comes in with jaundice you will always do a serum bilirubin and a serum conjugated bilirubin and you will always ask questions about obstructive jaundice and hemolysis okay those are the most important things to ask about and then you can talk about sepsis and going to how's the breastfeeding going and how dehydrated are they and has anyone in your family got Kriglin and Ajar syndrome? Okay, you can knock yourselves out with that later. All right, biliary atresia. So I haven't got a picture of this, but you can imagine it's the biliary tree and you get atresia of that. You get a failure to develop of the biliary tree. Okay, it needs urgent management. You need a, something called a Kasai procedure. I presume it's named after the person who invented it. It's called a hepatoportoenterostomy. Ostomy meaning making a hole and liver portoentero hole between the liver and the gut okay it's it, it nicely makes sense you're essentially making that even with that surgery i was interested to find out um that prognosis is still quite poor okay you will need to go and have a liver transplant but you need to pick it up early because otherwise it's death and it's really bad okay so do not miss this again and you'll find they won't expect much of you in terms of pediatrics and neonatal knowledge but make sure you know this when someone comes in jaundice you can exclude this if you show this in a history that you're ruling out hemolysis and obstruction straight away then you're flying, okay? So prolonged unconjugated causes, right? So that's conjugated. Um, breast milk jaundice, so 15% can last longer than two weeks, all right? Hypothyroidism, so that'll usually get picked up on a Guthrie um, heel prick test, but you need to still be careful. So ask thyroid questions and see whether there's any family history. Sepsis, again, like I said, sepsis at any point can cause jaundice and liver enzyme disorders, again, Kriglin in the jar and, and Gilbert's, okay? Right, so what time is it? Let's talk, okay, 15 minutes. Let's talk quickly about premature here. I know you guys have hung in there. I put, I front loaded it with all the important stuff. I just wanted you to like absolutely know this if you know nothing else. Prematurity, so preterm birth is classified as being born less than 37 weeks. These days, less than 37 is still fine. Less than 34, 32 is where you start to get issues of prematurity, really. Extremely premature, the classification changes all the times in all countries. Some use a week cutoff, some use a weight cutoff. I've included two reasonable cutoffs that people tend to use. Nowadays, if you go, so some of you Imperial students might get the chance to go to Chell West NICU. Some of them that are born in their 23rd, 24th week of life, it's unreal. So the, 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 gap, you know, the level to which NICUs can take now and start actually producing a quality of life is amazing. Having said that, um, you need survival rates. Its survival rate is better the older and the heavier you are. So we'll always try and delay birth. Um, and many will grow up with neurodevelopmental impairment. If you're born at 23 weeks, you, you have an 80% chance of having something like neurodevelopmental impairment or cerebral palsy um, at, at, you know, when you're a child, if you, if you live. Only 20% will make it out. So it's not great odds, but they are odds. Um, 
jaundice and congenital heart disease are more prevalent in premature populations, as are many, many things. So I'm going to talk you through a couple of the important conditions. Prematurity, like I said, is a whole thing in itself. I'm going to talk you through a couple of important things. So respiratory distress syndrome, um, incredibly interesting. So it's to do with the lung inflation that I talked about earlier. Okay. So this is the law of Laplace, right? So when you blow a balloon up, when it's right at the start, it's small. Okay. It's really hard to blow up because uh, it's collapsed and there's high surface tension. As the radius of that balloon increases, as you blow it up, it gets easier and easier, right? And that is essentially the law of Laplace, and that is what applies in the alveolus, okay? And smaller alveoli suffer more than bigger alveoli. So to combat this, our bodies have evolved to produce surfactant. And a surfactant is, a con is a, something produced by the type 2 pneumocytes in the lungs. That's the an SBA special. They always love asking what cells produce it. Um, mainly protein, a bit lipid. And what it does is it reduces the surface tension in the alveoli. It kind of lubricates them a bit more if you think about it like that maybe. And it allows them to inflate more easily after birth. The problem is that this is produced in the late second to early third trimester. So you're looking about the 26, 30 week mark, okay? Maybe, maybe a bit younger, maybe a bit older depending on who you, who you are. Here's a look at what happens when you have surfactant versus when you don't have surfactant in the lungs. So you should all be familiar with a flow volume uh, loop from earlier years when you're learning your lung physiology. Um, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on lung physiology, but I can see one graph small, one graph tall, okay? And that's, that's bad, okay? Small one is bad. Uh, so have surfactant, it's good for your lungs, all right? Uh, clinically, what are you going to have? You're going to have tachypnea, you're going to have nasal flaring, and you're going to have grunting. One thing I haven't mentioned is this is an essentially preterm condition. Past 34 weeks, you will not see respiratory distress syndrome, or you shouldn't, okay? And if you do, it's not your job to deal with it. It's definitely someone more senior's you will not see it. So if you see a baby 28 weeks, short of breath, uh, you know, born in someone's house, for example, uh, then in, out of hospital, then you need to be thinking respiratory distress syndrome. So your chest x-ray, you're going to get this appearance, okay? You're going to get a diffuse ground glass appearance with an air bronchogram. And an air bronchogram is where you can see the airways and normally the airways are lighter than the lung parenchyma, right, on an X-ray. But here you can see the airways are actually darker than the lung parenchyma. Can you appreciate that, especially on that right lung? Um, I don't know if I need to highlight. Maybe I'll highlight it for you guys. Oh, 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 oh no. Okay, hang on. I'm, I'm booming all over this thing. Right. Okay, hang on. There. Okay. So you see that lung parenchyma is now ground glass and lighter than the lung. The lung is darker on top. That's called an air bronchogram. Uh, right. Okay. And then all births less than 34 weeks in this country are given CuraSurf, okay, which is surfactant made from um, uh, pigs surfactant or made from cow surfactant. I don't know exactly which one it varies, but they're all given CuraSurf to stop development and respiratory succession in them. So you won't see it that much, okay, but it's still important to know about. If you see it on a discharge summary, for example, for a neonate who you're looking after later in life. Two doses of steroids. So when, when these, the mothers are, sorry, I should have said the mother is given two doses of steroids. If you've got a mother in profound preeclampsia who's going to need an emergency C-section, but can you hold off till the next day, they will give a dose of steroids, okay? 12 hours after a dose of steroids, that is enough to develop the lungs to give you a chance of A, not developing respiratory distress syndrome and also maturing the lungs, okay? So CuraSurf and steroids are the things that we do um, one antenatally and one at birth. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia is a condition which is, is tough to define. I wouldn't worry too much about it, but again, it's something you might see on a discharge summary. You need to understand what it is. Essentially, it's defined as having an oxygen requirement at 34 weeks, 36 weeks in someone who was born prematurely before. Okay, so this can be for any reason, but it's commonly from respiratory distress syndrome, admission to NICU, you know, poor respiratory effort at birth and, and they can't wean them off oxygen. Or if you overuse mechanical ventilation, you can cause barotrauma, which is trauma from too much pressure because the lungs are very delicate, especially in a neonate. Okay, too much pressure, barotrauma can cause bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And these kids after, you know, they reach term and on a discharge from a NICU might have ongoing oxygen requirement or need clinic follow-up, may never develop to the same heights of uh, a child who's not had uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Okay, is that all clear? Let me just answer questions. I've accidentally hidden my mouse. This is like the most old man thing to do. And now, I've... okay, chat. Um, 
what's the gap between the steroids? Steroids, how do steroids mature lungs? Very good question. Very poorly understood by me and probably everyone, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, what's the gap between steroids? So the gap between steroids uh, can be a matter of, I think you space it 12 to 24 hours apart. I'm sure the regimen varies. Just know that you're giving doses of steroids. It's usually betamethasone or dexamethasone that you give. Um, And now I can't move the chat because I can't see my mouse. This is terrible. Okay, fine. Let's move on. So necrotizing enterocolitis is the, is the second and most and other, and other super important neonatal condition, uh, premature condition to understand. Because it's got a huge mortality and it's worse the younger you are and it's worse the lighter you are. Okay. Um, so risk factors. So it's basically only for premature infants, right? You will not see this in a 40 week old, 40 week old or someone two months of age. The, the pathology is that there's hypoxia and ischemia of the bowel, okay? There's many things that contribute to this, IUGR, heart conditions that reduce bowel and gut circulation, asphyxia at birth, feeding, uh, formula feeding has a risk with it. Breastfeeding is actually protective. So it's quite interesting how that works. Um, so that's why you always try and breastfeed in a NICU. Um, and the thing is to do with the gut microbiome. And the second most important thing is infection. So if you have sepsis and you have, and they're very sort of the, the barrier between the vasculature and the bowel wall is supposedly very thin and underdeveloped in the neonate or premature neonate. And if your bugs can get from one to the other, you can get bad things. So basically it's a combination of in, infection or colonization of the bowel and ischemia to the bowel, okay? Clinically, what are you going to get? You're going to get bilious aspirates via the NG or vomiting, okay? And someone asked in the chat, bilious vomiting. Bilious vomiting basically means uh, you've got vomiting with an upper GI obstruction, okay? Or upper GI scheme, or upper GI stricture, or something like that. That's, you know, there's bilious contents which are coming back up. That's all it is. Uh, you can get it in adults as well. Blood mucus in the stool uh, from ischemia or from, uh, you know, uh, like in the words, enterocolitis, inflammation of the bowel. Abdominal distension and discoloration. Uh, these can be pretty nasty signs, and these can be signs you're headed for a bad, a bad case, as we'll show you later. And they can become peritonitic because you can get a rigid abdomen. Okay, you can get a rigid abdomen with a shifting dullness or some fluid, and and these things can be nasty, and they can perforate. Okay, they can perforate and become peritonitic. Um, features of sepsis on the side. You also want to look at systemic things: apnea, bradycardia. Uh, fevers. I mean, these all vary in, in the premature neonate, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. On an x-ray, you're going to get these features. So distended loops of bowel, intramural air, and sometimes pneumoperitoneum if they've perforated. All right. Uh, here's a look at an abdominal x-ray. Um, so there you've got one of the management. So you've got some leads, looks like sort of cardiac monitoring leads, and you've got an NG tube that looks like it's in the stomach, uh, but obviously the stomach is over um, overlined by the bowel. And you can see here, I hope you can appreciate, I've highlighted two of the main features to look out for. This is a no pneumoperitoneum in this case, because they haven't perforated, but there you can see dilated loops of bowel, okay? And the other thing you can see, I think, and I'm not 100% certain, but I think on this one, I tried to show you one with all the features being good. I couldn't find a good one with intramural air. But if you look there, you can kind of see a double outline of the bowel right at the top and towards the left of your screen on that little picture, the red circle I've outlined, that little bit of bowel there, you can see some air between the, the, the wall uh, layers. Okay, and that's intramural air. And that's again, a bad sign, inflammation and anaerobic bacteria and all sorts of stuff is producing gas in the bowel uh, and causing trouble. Okay, so that's neck. Management of neck. So conservative management, keep them near my mouth. You put an NG tube, you decompress, and you rest the bowel. Same as in an adult with, you know, ischemic bowel or a number of other surgical conditions. You give broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, and it's funny, you cover aerobic, anaerobic, gram positive, gram negative. You cover everything because you don't know what's growing in there. You don't know what's come from blood. You don't know what's come from bowel. You don't know what's come from mother or what's come from the external environment. Parenteral nutrition, you need to keep them well fed. So you will put them on parenteral nutrition. Here is a neck abdomen, okay? And that is bad. That looks tense. You've got distended veins on the abdomen. Uh, it's red. It looks, it just looks angry. I mean, you could show that to anyone and be like, that looks bad, okay? It just doesn't naturally look healthy. 
Uh, surgical. So if they perforate or you think they're failing medical conservative management, you need to deal with that. So peritoneal drainage is something I read about. I've never seen it done. I didn't even heard about it until I read about it last week, um, where you can do a peritoneal drain, but it actually has worse outcomes than a laparotomy. Laparotomy and resection of the non-viable bowel. What do we mean by non-viable? We mean bowel that is ischemic, necrotic, septic, um, perforated, anything that's not going to pass stool in an effective way. Okay. So there is a picture of some bowel. I couldn't tell you which end is which, to be honest, because it's all, it all looks like small bowel to me. Um, but you can see, so if you can appreciate the left side of that picture that I've shown you, the bowel has a lot of dark spots on it. And those dark spots are kind of indicative of ischemia and necrosis. And that's probably non-viable bowel. That needs to be resected. Okay. And that will be resected. And you can imagine that having your bowel resected as an 80 year old is not great. So signs seem very similar to interception. Uh, close. You are, you are close. That is, they are reasonably similar. Um, the big difference is this guy will be outside the, the womb at this point um, and will be 28, 30 weeks, tw 24, 28, 30 weeks, okay? Whereas your, your interception patient will be a lot older, okay? So this is a premature condition. If someone presents premature with abdomen -y stuff, it's probably neck, all right? That's the best way to think about it, especially at uh, a med school and F1 level. Again, I can't get rid of the chat. This is really sad. Okay, uh, so what you're gonna get complications, right? Having your gut out as an adult is bad. Okay, I'm on general surgery now and all I see is complications of bowel resections that look great um, and then end up being horrible. Uh, so it's not good and it's not good if you have it before you're actually meant to be born, as you can imagine, that's a really, really bad sign. So short gut syndrome, so you get poor absorption of nutrients, you get growth failure and naturally, you get deficiencies of lots of vitamins, especially if you get a small bowel resected, uh, B12 and folate. Um, you get strictures developing postoperatively, adhesions, all the regular surgical stuff. Abscesses, bad, bad stuff happens. But if you don't have it, the neonate dies. So it's kind of, you kind of got to do it, right? Um, they can end up with a stoma if the bowel is really unviable and you can't make an anastomosis. Um, and if they do make an anastomosis, that can then leak and lead to more problems. So that's neck, okay? Neck is bad. Here is a really good um, summary of neonatal issues. I haven't covered a lot of these, okay? I've covered two of the main ones or two and a half of the main ones. Um, I've highlighted the things you should really focus on for your, for your exams. Um, this is from the Illustrated Textbooks of Pediatrics um, by Lasau. He's, he's really, he's done a lot. I mean, Tom Lasau's on basically all the pediatrics books. You can't get, go anywhere without seeing his name. Um, but this was super useful to just get a, an overview. I can picture in my head a premature neonate uh, let's talk about birth injuries. So this first one is chignon, okay? So this is, I think that's how you say it. So if you look at it, it's a well-circumscribed round raised lesion, more cutaneous than the others that you can see there, okay? From a von Tuss delivery, all right? So that is exclusively from the von Tuss suction effect on the skin. It's cutaneous and it doesn't really cause much of an effect. My old housemate, we did feel his head during fifth year because he had a von Tuss. Um, and he said he could feel something. We were like, probably not, okay? Now, got Kefal hematoma here. I can't actually describe the picture to you because I've got the chat box stuck there because I've hidden my mouse. So I'm gonna try and describe it roughly. Kefal hematoma does not cross the midline. There's a really good way of just remembering these two, right? Kefal hematoma does not cross the midline. It's a small um, hemorrhage in one of the layers of the uh, uh, scalp, okay? Um, it's not something to worry about unless you get profound hemolysis or there's an underlying intraventricular hemorrhage or subdural hemorrhage, okay? Uh, and then this is caput, succedinium, okay? And this is two words uh, and there's a gap in the middle. So that's how I remember that it crosses the midline of the skull, okay? Here you go. So crosses suture lines means crossing this, okay? Crossing this suture, the, what's this, sagittal, right? Sagittal suture, okay? So when they say crossing the midline, they mean crossing this, this plane, this, this plane here, okay? Like if you gave the baby a middle parting, all right, then um, it would be only on one side if in kephal hematoma and caput succedinium is two words with a gap and I just imagine it on both sides of the head like crossing the midline. Well, that's quite a nice way of remembering as well. Okay, let's just go through some quick, you guys have stuck really well, how many down? We're down to 140, you stuck at it really, really well uh, and we're just about finishing. Uh, um, 
Let's just start with some easy stuff. So birth injuries are more common in shoulder dystocia, macrosomia, and breech presentations, okay, as you'd imagine, including those uh, cephal hematoma and caputs, okay? Um, nerve palsies also occur. So you can have a Bell's palsy from a forceps delivery. The forceps can, you know, hit the face and give you a Bell's palsy, and the baby will look like it's had a bit of a stroke straight away. Um, Herb's palsy, so your C5-6 roots, that gives you a waiter's tip um, presentation with the right arm or left arm, sorry, um, either one. And then you can also have fractures. So these can be intended. You can get a clavicle fracture from, uh, you know, really difficult uh, shoulder dystocia birth, or it can be incidental from the birthing. A humerus, femur, and clavicle fractures are all possible during birth. Now, my final question for today, just a quick little, just, just grab it and go kind of question. Young lady has an elective C-section at, at, at term. You're the medical student, you're very sharp, you know all your normal ranges and you look at the baby and you're like, oh, he's breathing a bit hard. And you think the baby's got tachypnea, right? Respiratory rate, let's say like 60. Uh, and they're saturating at 94, and SATS probe's not hanging on properly. There's nothing else that concerns you. And you turn to your consultant and you say, well, I think this baby might have X. So put in chat, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis in this situation? Yeah, good, exactly. So transient tachypnea of the newborn. Okay, so again, if a baby, now you need to stratify by age, really important. For SBAs, they can't really give you much. Okay, if a baby is, uh, someone has tried to do the pathophysiology for, you guys should just teach this for me, actually. It's been, everyone's like two steps ahead with their questions. Um, if you think about it, right, if you've got a premature neonate who is short of breath, it's probably respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, maybe a pneumothorax, but normally respiratory distress syndrome. If you've got a term baby with a C-section who's short of breath, it's usually going to be transient tachypnea of the newborn. You don't really need many other bits of information. The other bits of information are that the baby is usually well. Okay, they can be tachypnea. They can have a mild oxygen requirement, but they will not be in, in properly cyanosed or exhausted or, uh, you know, uh, uh, bradycardic, okay? So there we go, transient tachypnea of the newborn. Very common in cesarean sections. So during a vaginal birth, the passage of the neonate down the canal, all that pressure and squeezing, all those pressure changes, essentially force fluid out of the fetal lungs, okay? And over the course of delivery, if it's, you know, over the course of hours to minutes to hours, um, during delivery, you can then end up with a lot of fluid being out of the baby's lungs and the baby can inflate lungs properly and breathe. If you take a baby straight out with a C-section, they can have a lot of fluid, amniotic fluid and such, still in their lungs, and that takes a long time for their vasculature to absorb back. And once it happens, it's okay, but it can take some hours. So they can be uh, a little bit hypoxic and a bit tachypneic for a while. 